So this morning I want to talk about Unitarianism and Buddhism, two religious traditions that are very dear to me. I've titled this as a question, are we joined at the hips? And my real question is, is Unitarianism actually just a practice of Buddhism? Um, so I want to compare the principles of the UUA, the Unitarian Universalist Association, to the beliefs and practices of Buddhism. And I want to talk about how Buddhism and UUs are very much alike and how sometimes we're different. But first I want to ask, does anybody here attend the Suns games, the Jacksonville Suns, the baseball team we've got, the double-A team? Come on. <laughs> Some of you then know that we were the South League AA champions this year. I enjoy attending these baseball games with friends, and, and it reminds me of the story of the Buddhist hot dog vendor. There was a Buddhist hot dog vendor at a Suns game, let's say, calling out, get your tofu hot dogs here, sauerkraut, relish, onions, ketchup, mustard, so a fan came up and said, yeah, I'll have a hot dog. Um, if you would, make me one with everything. So the Buddhist makes a hot dog with everything on it, hands it to him, and says, that'll be $2. The man reaches in his pocket, sees he only has a $10 bill, hands it to the Buddhist vendor. The vendor takes it, turns around, and starts making a hot dog for another person. The guy stands there, and he says, Wait a minute. Oh, excuse me, where is my change? The vendor turns back to him and says, Oh, you know, change comes from within. <laughs> so, so, in many ways, Buddhism and Unitarianism are deeply connected. I want to name a few of these so that we will get a sense within UUA, our Unitarian congregations, how deep that connection is. James Ishmael Ford is the UU minister of the Providence, Rhode Island Church, and he is an ordained Soto Zen Buddhist priest. He also leads in Rhode Island, in the Providence, Rhode Island community, the Boundless Way Zen group. Ken Collier, a recently retired UU minister, lives in California, and he wrote a book called Finger Pointing Essays, looking at how Unitarian Universalists can use some of the teachings within Buddhism to expand and understand more deeply our spirituality. In fact, we're using this as a text in the Spiritual Studies group uh, this fall, and you're invited to uh, join us. Um, many UU congregations host Buddhist groups. Um, in fact, this congregation hosts two such groups. One is a Soto Zen meditation group meeting on Thursday nights, and the other is a Buddhist meditation group meeting Sunday mornings. Uh, in addition, the, the Buckman Bridge UU congregation has a Buddhist group. Overall, there's about 100 UU congregations in the US that have Buddhist organizations affiliated with them. I was a little surprised to learn not, not that surprised, but it's, it, it was not an expected thing. 9% of all UUs are, are Buddhists. Another 16% of UUs identify Buddhism as being very important in their spiritual life. So 25% of UUs have some kind of connection or affiliation with Buddhism. So I'm going to talk a little bit about Buddhism and the seven principles, but I, for those of you who don't have a familiarity with Buddhism, let me give you just a little bit of background about Buddhism and its origin. It begins with the Great Awakening of Siddhartha Gautama about 500 BCE, 2,500 years ago. He was a man who was um, heir to a kingdom he was going to be the next prince, next king, in the North Indian kingdom that he grew up in. He found this to be something that was not a satisfying prospect. He really wanted to reach a deeper spiritual understanding of the nature of life. And so he spent seven years in searching 
through the various religions, religious traditions in India to try to find something that would allow him a deeper connection with the world. After seven years, he still hadn't found it, and he finally decided, I've got to make a final desperate effort, and he spent 49 days in continuous meditation. At the end of the 49 days, he still had not reached this real realization. So he said, I will, I will sit during the night, and I will give it my utmost effort to try to understand the nature of reality. And he did. And in the morning, as Venus, the morning star, was rising, he had this great spiritual awakening that he was seeking. It was a, an experience that was so great and so complete and so without words that he thought, well, this is great. This is wonderful for me. I don't think this experience can be related to any other person. It, I have no words to speak to it about. So then he spent another several weeks in meditation thinking about this and finally concluded that there was possibly a way that he could speak about this, that he could explain the central role that meditation played in his understanding. And I'm going to abbreviate this. He had three points that he thought he could express. The first is the idea of dependent origination, which is that everything arises together at one time. He's not speaking about creation or a creator. He's saying what happens in this one moment, the, the moment that we actually are in right now, is that everything, everywhere, is connected together, and we are a part of that. Using that insight, he formulated what are called the Four Noble Truths. This first truth is that life has both joys and sorrows in it, but the joys never last, and the sorrows lead to dissatisfaction. His second insight was even though dissatisfaction arises from both joys and sorrows, that this dissatisfaction is a result of our clinging to our expectations. And his third insight was that we could find a way to let go of that clinging. And the fourth is that there is a path to do that. That's the eightfold path. It's a framework for living. I'm not going to try to talk about the eight parts of that, but I want to collapse it into three chunks. The Eightfold Path has these parts, wisdom, conduct, and meditation. Wisdom is when we live every act fully as if it is our last. It's when we have universal love and compassion for all. It's when we learn to respond and not to react. Ethical conduct, the second chunk that we have, is when words are both kind and true, they can change the world. Every mindful act is a pathway to enlightenment or awakening. And we can live without exploiting others or exploiting our world. The third chunk is meditative living. This, this summarizes as the more I give, the more I get. Pay attention to life in this moment. Don't live in the past and don't try to dwell in the future that doesn't exist yet. And finally, pay attention to your mind. See the world and yourself without judgment. So with that short background, I want to look at our seven UU principles and tie that to some of these thoughts from the Buddha. The first UU principle is the inherent worth and dignity of every person. There are three things that Buddhists recognize as fundamental to their practice. This is the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Sangha. The Buddha is the teacher, the fully awake teacher. The Dharma is, are the teachings, those things that the Buddha taught, that everyone is awake and everyone is capable of being fully awake. And the third is the community, or the Sangha. That is, those people who live by what the Buddha had to teach. 
in the Sangha, every person is respected for their own worth and dignity. So I think the central role of these three treasures in Buddhism make it clear that both Buddhists and Unitarian Universalists are equally supportive of this principle. We both, as Buddhists and Unitarians, honor the place of the wealthy and of the very poor in our congregations. We honor the role of every member. The second UU principle is justice, equity, and compassion in human relations. And to me, I found this best expressed in the precepts of Buddhism. Here are some of those precepts. The three pure precepts, don't do evil, do only good, benefit all beings. And there are some others, protect all creatures, be generous, be sexually moral, always tell the truth, and cultivate clarity. I think these fundamental precepts, principles of Buddhism, are at the core of what Unitarians and Universalists believe. So I think, again, UUs and Buddhists are singing from the same hymn book. The third UU principle is acceptance of one another and encouragement to spiritual growth in our congregations. A little bit of background. In Buddha's time and place in North India, 500 BCE, there was a caste-based society. So the Brahmins led everything. They were the rulers. They were the religious leaders. Um, there was a lower caste, the lowest caste, uh, the untouchables, who did all the dirty work and the hard work. It was a society where women had no status other than that that they acquired by marriage and by having children. Women were always subject to the, to the decisions made by men. Religion relied on dogma. In this cultural context, the Buddha did something very different. He accepted followers of whatever caste. He accepted women as followers. He even accepted as followers people who had tried to kill him. And there were at least two instances that we know of where this happened. While originally only men could be monastics, he later opened the, the monastic order to women. And finally, he said this very important thing. Don't believe anything I tell you until you test it for yourself and see if it's true for you. So I think it's very clear, looking at this, that you use and Buddhists practice the same kind of acceptance of one another and encouragement to spiritual growth. We, in fact, are a community of people who want to test things for ourselves and see if they're true for us. That's really why I think most of us are here. The fourth principle is a free and responsible search for truth and meaning. That's the fourth UU principle. Buddhism teaches us that it's the responsibility of each person to examine their own mind and find their own truth. And then having found that truth, to look within themselves to see what meaning that truth has for them. Once we understand that we're responsible for our own truth, Buddhism holds that we are also bound to live that truth, and by living that truth, provide a means for other people to see an approach to reality that they could also example. So like you use, Buddhists are entirely a do-it-yourself religion. The fifth UU principle is the right of conscience and the use of the democratic process within our congregations and in society at large. This is a little more difficult for me to interpret, but here's what I think. Compassion is a core value of Buddhism. In fact, one of the favorite symbols in Buddhist mythology is the symbol of Kuan Yin a woman who represents compassion and who is said to be able to hear the cries of need throughout the world. And in statues, she's often illustrated as having multiple arms. And this is so that she can provide the care and the attention that's needed to many different kinds of people at any one time. So I think compassion is really the essential expression of conscience. Now, I'll have to be clear, Buddhism doesn't really say anything about democracy. In fact, um, a lot of Buddhist countries are 
ruled by a single person. Some of them are ruled by people who are actually are not so nice themselves. But Buddhism does recognize the importance of every person and that the actions of every person influence not only themselves but the rest of society. So while Buddhism doesn't really valorize democracy, it does place ultimate reliance on the individual in the same way that democracy does. So I'm going to say that the congruence of UUs and Buddhists on this, give them a pass on this. We're, we're kind of close together. The sixth UU principle, the goal of world community with peace, liberty, and justice for all. This, I think, is really well said by the Dalai Lama, and I'm going to quote from him. Universal humanitarianism is essential to solve global problems. Compassion is the pillar of world peace. All world religions are already for world peace in this way, as are all humanitarians of whatever ideology. Each individual has a universal responsibility to shape institutions to serve human needs. So I think it's clear that both UUs and Buddhists seek peace, liberty, and justice for all. The seventh and last UU principle is respect for the interdependent web of all existence of which we are a part. To me, this really arises out of Buddha's fundamental insight and experience. The first thing, or one of the first things he says upon awakening, is what Buddhists call dependent origination. That is, that all things arise together. And as I said earlier, this isn't a statement about creation or about a creator or even what constitutes a universal beginning of things. It's a call to us to live in this moment and pay attention to each other and the world that we are a part of. The insight that comes from meditation and is called awakening is always characterized as illuminating the deep connection of all things. Sometimes Buddhists talk about an idea, a picture called Indra's net. This is a picture uh, of a net of jewels hanging over a castle. And the net of jewels is connected in its warp and its weft and the up and down and cross streams. And at each intersection of the warp and weft, there is a jewel, a brightly polished jewel, and it, it reflects every other jewel. If you touch a jewel in that net, if you move it, every other jewel has to move too, and the reflection of every jewel in that net moves. So everything is connected in time and space. And a change in anything means a change in every other thing. So I think you use and Buddhists are bound together in seeing the world and all that exists in it as a single whole. So I want to end with that and leave you with a final Buddhist thought. This is from a Buddhist teacher. Um, you should know that when Buddhists sit and meditate together, they often have a cup of hot tea afterwards. Or in Buddhist congregations, at the end, there might be a meal with hot tea. So this is what this teacher said. Drink tea and nourish life. With the first sip, experience joy. With the second sip, experience satisfaction. With the third sip, experience peace. With the fourth soup, have a Danish. <laughs> and I hope there will be Danish downstairs and that you will all join us in the social hall. Thank you. <laughs>